Um, so in speaking of new materialism in relation to contemporary art, <clears throat> I'm going to look at the idea of art as an object, <clears throat> as having materiality, in relation to the idea that the aesthetic is a privileged site within which materialism or object-oriented ontology may be apprehended or understood. <clears throat> I'm going to focus on Timothy Morton's ideas around the role of the aesthetic in relation to causality itself. And I'll relate this con to contemporary art via a characterization of contemporary art as post-conceptual art, via the notion of the dematerialization of the art object in Lucy Lippard's 1997 essay, Escape Attempts. <clears throat> At the end, I'll discuss my own project in relation to these themes. New materialism or object-oriented ontology has broad applications. In Timothy Morton's book, Realist Magic, Objects, Ontology, Causality, he describes the nature of causality within the world itself as aesthetic, which makes art for him intrinsic to new thinking around causality. The reason why art is important is that it's an exploration of causality, which as we know since post-Newtonian physics involves a lot more than just little, little metal balls clunking one another. Entities interact in a sensual ether that is, at least to some extent, non-local and non-temporal. That's how objects can influence one another despite the fact that they are enclosed from all forms of access. So when old-fashioned art criticism speaks of timeless beauty, it is saying something quite profound about the nature of causation, not about spuriously universal human values. So for Morton, aesthetics is vital to an understanding of the world as object-oriented, wherein everything, including us, is an object impacting other objects, rather than an understanding of the world from a human-centric view. Morton links the idea of art with aesthetics. In reality, the term aesthetics has multiple definitions, varying from the study of beauty in art or nature, the actual experience of beauty, the philosophy of taste, <clears throat> and theories or philosophy of art. It's a vague term, but Morton conflates its varied meanings into one, with the result that a view of causality as sensual necessarily links it for him to an idea of aesthetics as the study of art or to an idea of what art is or should be. Morton states that the idea that causality is aesthetic is good news for art students since causality floats in front of objects, figuratively speaking. It doesn't lie underneath them like some grey machinery. Another way of saying this is that causality must belong to the aesthetic dimension. To study the aesthetic dimension then is to study causality. Within this view, reality is not a construct. Rather, reality is real because it is encrypted against access by any object, including a probing human mind. So an effort to view the world as operating aesthetically means we escape the sense of subjective views leading to the idea that reality is an illusion. The way things appear to us, impact us impacts us and is seen to have the potential to act on and change the world. There is thus great agency for aesthetics as appearance here, and the link Morton makes between the terms art and aesthetics implies that art itself has a major role to play in an object-oriented view of things. However, he goes on, the trouble is when you only have the meshwork, the mask, without the possibility that there's something real underneath it, then you have no play, no pretense, no illusion, no display, no magic. You know it's an illusion, so it isn't an illusion. You know there is no essence, this becomes the essence, a shadowy inverted form of the very essentialism you're trying to escape. This is the trouble with performance art, or at least the manifestos of conceptual art. By undoing the difference between art and non-art, by self-consciously getting rid of self-consciousness and professional artists, conceptual art ignores the rift between essence and appearance, reducing the ontological to the merely ontic an overall atmosphere of jaded cynicism hangs over it. So it would seem that performance art and conceptual art, at least in its pure manifesto form, are not valid forms of art in relation to the idea of causality as aesthetic, because by introducing the idea of anti-art, or by questioning the nature of the art object, they remove the aesthetic element of art, of Morton's sense of things becoming as objects. They question the essence of art, and this becomes their essence, and nothing is real. 
I would argue that the introduction of non-art into art could be seen to extend further back historically than the more recent events of performance or conceptual art. Indeed, all modernist art may be characterised in one way or another as a striving towards that which is not art, even if this striving still occurs within concrete objects. Morton's identification of object-oriented ontology with the field of art via aesthetics as appearance is problematic here. While he may prefer certain types of art over non-object or anti-art art, these movements arguably the very drive of the ontological project of modernist art, cannot be removed from art history, and their impact on the development of Western art towards contemporary art itself can't be undone. Lucy Lippard's six years, the dematerialization of the art object from 1966 to 1972, which was originally published in 1973, is an anthology of texts documenting the conceptual art movement. The book was reissued in 1997 with a new introduction called Escape Attempts by Lippard, wherein she reflects on the nature of the art of that time 25 years earlier. While not herself an artist, Lippard was closely associated with the conceptual art movement, participating within it as a curator, writer and art critic. However, her experimental style of curating and writing could in itself be viewed as art-like. Escape Attempt's picture of conceptual art is very detailed. While Lippard was herself situated within the New York conceptual art scene, she writes of the internationalism of the movement, occurring as it did seemingly spontaneously and concurrently over a broad sweep of cities globally. The essay refers to the many and varied forms conceptual art took, such as male art, earthworks, performance art, happenings, actions, and even minimalism, while pointing to Solowitz's distinction between conceptual art with a small c and conceptual art with a capital C. Lippard describes capital C conceptual art as work in which the idea is paramount and the material form is secondary, lightweight, ephemeral, cheap, unpretentious and or dematerialised. In Escape Attempts, Lippard quotes Sol Lewitt from 1969. Ideas alone can be works of art. They are a chain of development that may eventually find some form. All ideas need not be made physical. The words of one artist to another may induce an idea chain if they share the same concept. And then John Baldessari, I was beginning to suspect that information could be interesting in its own right and need not be visual. And then Joseph Boys, to be a teacher is my greatest work of art. The rest is the waste product, a demonstration. Objects aren't very important for me anymore. Similar quotes from a variety of artists may be found from this time. Artists whose work we may understand visually today desired in their words at least an escape from the image and the object. The dematerialised nature of conceptual art is described by Lippard as an attempt to escape what she calls the frame and pedestal syndrome of art and it was anti-art as commodity. In 1968, Lippard and John Chandler wrote of ultra-conceptual art as evolving from art as idea and art as action. Conceptual art's dematerialised form made it an inexpensive and unintimidating medium, which Lippard identifies as having been therefore more accessible to women than previous art movements had been, encourage, encouraging women to, quote, move through this crack in the art world's walls, unquote. Lippard writes that while conceptual art may now appear timid and disconnected when compared to the political, political activism of the time, the conceptual artists themselves looked and sounded like radicals. Even if the art was apolitical, its presentation, the form or lack of form it took, was radical. It was usually the form of conceptual art that was political rather than its content. There existed a desire to attack notions of originality, individual style and genius quote, the most cherished aspects of patriarchal ruling class art, unquote, Lippard writes. The sentiments Lippard and others express and her memories and accounts of conceptual art as a movement seem far removed from the, quote, atmosphere of jaded cynicism, unquote, that Morton claims hangs over conceptual art. Nonetheless, Lippard is realistic about the actual outcomes of the period. However rebellious the escape attempts, most of the work remained art referential and neither economic nor aesthetic ties to the art world were fully severed, though at times we like to think that they were hanging by a thread. 
Even as early as 1973, Lippard wrote in the postface of the original publication of Six Years, hopes that conceptual art would be able to avoid the general commercialization, the destructively progressive approach of modernism were for the most part unfounded. He describes how in 1969, artists believed nobody would want to pay money for objects such as, quote, a Xerox sheet referring to an event past or never directly perceived, a group of photographs documenting an ephemeral situation or condition, a project for work never to be completed, words spoken but not heard, unquote, not recorded, unquote. However, only three years later, major conceptualists are selling work for substantial sums here and in Europe. They are represented by the world's most prestigious galleries. Nonetheless, for Lippard and other conceptual artists, the hope remains that, quote, the most exciting art might still be buried in social energies not yet recognised as art, unquote. In 1997, reflecting on the time of conceptual art, Lippard hopes that even while art's escape was temporary, that the spirit of the art remains, waiting to be tapped into by artists of the future. She ends her essay with the sentence, art was recaptured and sent back to its white cell, but parole is always a possibility. Here again, the actual and original sentiment of conceptual artists is at odds with Morton's views on conceptual art, where he views the art as object as intrinsic to a more radical or open view of the world, Lippard and other conceptualists viewed it as a kind of cell, two quite opposite views of art's potential as an object to act positively in the world. So which one is it? Where does the art belong? Is the object a cell which holds the transformative power of art prisoner, or is the materiality of art a force with which we may apprehend objects' impact in the world in their becoming, a way of apprehending reality itself? It all depends what art is. In Morton's argument, he refers in a pos positive sense to the emotional reactions to, to be had to paintings by Turner and the optical effects of Bridget Riley's paintings, artists from two quite different periods of British art. In Lippard's case, she restricts her argument to the era and artists of conceptual art itself, a short movement which seemed new, where there was a feeling that artists were coming close to doing something more radical with art in the world than had been possible before. I see Morton's argument around the power of objects as aesthetic, being informed by a sense of art as something essential and unchanging over time, wherein a painting by Riley or Turner can hold equal power as objects. For Lippard, however, the novelty and promise of art as a concept rather than an object inadvertently and unavoidably places it within the progressive ideals of modernist art, where an ideal future point exists in which art becomes its purest, least corrupted self. Whichever view one takes, it's the realm of contemporary art in which we participate as artists today, a large, almost undefinable realm, wherein most, if not all, mediums or styles of art apply. The art can exist within an object or without one. Every medium from painting to performance is valid. Nonetheless, and despite this openness, some theorists do attempt a definition of contemporary art, one of whom is Peter Osborne in his book, Anywhere or Not at All, Philosophy of Contemporary Art, which was published last year. Osborne's final definition or philosophy of contemporary art is far-reaching, detailed, and somewhat difficult to rein into any one statement, despite his desire to create a meaningful discourse for contemporary art, rather than allow it to be the entirety and variety of forms under its banner today. He believes contemporary art needs to be defined historically rather than aesthetically. As a result of this, he views contemporary art as a post-conceptual art. For Osborne, contemporary art is not to be defined in terms of aesthetics, since conceptual art proved art to be a concept as existing outside aesthetics. However, Osborne views conceptual art's failure to fully escape the aesthetic realm proves also that the aesthetic is an inescapable aspect of art. For Osborne, therefore, conceptual art's failure is in fact its success. In this sense, contemporary art is not so much a prison of objects and aesthetics, rather the proof of the inescapability of the aesthetic in art is viewed as part of contemporary art's very definition. The three writers I've been discussing, Osborne, Lippard and Morton, are not, as far as I'm aware, practicing artists, even if Lippard's curating and writing style were art-like. 
It's one thing to write about art and say what it is or what it should be, and it's quite another thing to have to make art or to be an artist or to know what to do as art, especially in relation to the legacy of conceptual art. For me, as a cont contemporary art practitioner, the dilemma of a contemporary art practice involves questions such as what to make as art, what medium to employ, should any medium be employed, what form can a radical art practice take when all forms are permitted, and in Warhol's words, what can we do for art? For me, art as an expression of the individual who made it, or as the communication of ideas to a greater public, or even as an aesthetic experience, are not particularly convincing or compelling. As a younger art student with lots of questions, the discovery that the Western art tradition, of which I was a part, had been a development through, the discovery that that tradition had been a development through a modernist period of self-questioning, leading to art's emancipation from the object was important, as it led in fact to my becoming an artist. The discovery explained to me why some things were art and some things weren't, even when they looked the same. The puzzling things that were art, maybe a blank canvas or a rock on the gallery floor, were important because they were a part of art's ontological development. While it didn't help me to know what to make as a contemporary artist, it helped me to understand modern Western art as a history, and it seemed important to situate my own practice relevant to that history. Since I began studying art, I've tried to deal with the question, what can we do for art in different ways? The most recent iteration of my work is my end of art project with which I'm engaged both within and outside my PhD. It involves saying the end of art while maintaining a practice as an artist. The end of art is something I feel and to say it allows me to engage with art as theory or philosophy in line with contemporary art's heritage in conceptual art and modernism's general drive towards the end. For me, contemporary art as a post-conceptual art is a post-object art. However, if I maintain an art practice in the face of this statement, I can at least point to the seemingly inevitable expectation and paradox that an art practice involves objects or aesthetics in some form. Um, so the work I've made for the New Materialism Conference exhibition here today results from the need within my end of art project to accommodate art as both co concept and object. It's a tentative work made in the spirit of a test or prototype, resulting from a series of other tests and experiments shown here, wherein I've attempted to revive the materialism of the art and craft of the 70s era in which I grew up. While I grew to develop disdain for this crafty realm in the 80s and 90s, it now holds a certain nostalgia and relevance for me. I painted on Hessian for last year's conference exhibition here at SCA around the theme of feminism. My original intention had been to include elements of sewing, weaving and craft alongside the painting in order to allude to the strength of the do-it-yourself crafty aesthetic of the women's movement of the time. The handmade banners of protest, the sense of getting back to basics and making things from scratch. While emphasising the fabric or materiality of the work itself, this has the useful equivalence of harking back to a period in which art returned to its status as object, post its failure as a concept in the previous decade. Therefore, this most recent work of my end of art project is both personal and theoretical. The sense of magic or power inherent to objects, as argued in the new materialism, relates to this new work in that a state of having nothing to make or say of not knowing what form art should take, <clears throat> I can use the materials themselves or the force of the materials to create the art object for me, to guide me through the myriad of decisions that an artist must make when dealing with an object. Although I began the work here with some sense of intention, such as the period of the 70s, of art and craft, and the weaving trend of the period, I let the materials of that era, jute, fabric, and wool, almost form themselves through the weaving process into something approximating what I had in mind <clears throat> post my previous experiments with Hessian. This way of working, while common to many artists, is new to me and seems to hold potential in navigating the end of art state. The title of this work is the number it holds in the consecutive production of end of art works I began three years ago. To end here, I'll briefly describe my own view of contemporary art's relevance to new materialist, materialist thought in relation to speculative realism, 
without disavowing the anti-art drive of modernism or the dematerialized nature of performance or conceptual art as Morton's thesis tends to. If we consider the tradition of Western art in its development towards contemporary art as having progressed through the self-referential, self-critical and ontological process of modernism, we can see that the subject of this tradition is art itself. The inevitable drive towards purity or an essentialism of the art object through this tradition leads arguably to the end of the subject or the end of art. If we parallel the subject of Western modernism's ontological tradition, that is art, to the human subject in the Western philosophical tradition, it may be seen that the new desire within philosophy to step outside ourselves or to step outside the privileging of the human subject's viewpoint in order to apprehend a more real reality can be linked to the end of the subject art, to the stepping outside of definitions of art. In this sense, it is as a model of Western thought that for me the value of art resides. Thank you.